Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Janelle Riley from Variety. Before we are joined by our guests today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. And over the past year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a SAG after artist and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you so much for your support. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce the stars of Genius Aretha, Courtney B. Vance and Cynthia Revo. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. <laughs> As I said, this is an audience of SAG after actors. So I actually like to start at the beginning by asking, how did you get your SAG card? What was the, the job that brought that, that special card to you? You go first, Courtney. <laughs> um, uh, that would probably be, um, the first film was Hamburger Hill. Oh, cool. Oh, wow, really? Shot in, in the Philippines, yes. Wow. That was your first movie? First movie. They threw you into the deep end. Yeah, we were we were deeply in the in the uh, um, the the forest of uh, um, the rainforest of uh, the Philippines. We were in uh, uh, Makati, and uh, when it rained, it was when it was supposed to rain, the sun was out, and when it was supposed to be sunny, the, it rained. And that's just that's just uh, the Philippines for you in the summer. Wow, um, Cynthia, for you. Uh, my my SAG card was given to me when I did Widows. Um, so I'm a newbie, uh, kind of. So that was my first film, and that's when I got my SAG card. Yeah, doing Widows with Steve McQueen. Jeez, the, the, this question like usually gets such humble responses. Like people did a McDonald's commercial, and you both <laughs> came out of the gate in great films. <laughs> well, again, congratulations on Genius Aretha. I actually want to go back to the beginning and ask how this project found its way to you and, and what attracted you to the roles. Uh, Courtney, I've heard you really connected to C.L. Franklin because you also grew up in Detroit and both music and gospel were a part of your life. Yes, I, I grew up in Detroit. I was, uh, um, uh, evidently we were on West Grand Boulevard and evidently that uh, uh, when we were, I was about seven, six, seven during when the riots happened in 1967. And um, evidently the, the New Bethel uh, Baptist Church was about a mile and a half from there. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a, a baby, so I don't, you know, didn't know anything uh, about, uh, about the, them. Uh, but um, um, I grew up, you know, we grew up in the same city and I, I had heard a lot about uh, the fact that the Reverend uh, was very, very close friends with uh, Martin Luther King and and in my research, you know, he was, uh, there, there was all kind of celebrities at the house and politicos at the, at the house uh, all the time. So it was the absolute center of, of the civil rights movement and the, and the church world. What interested you in playing him? Um, the, uh, uh, I'd heard that, that Anthony Hemingway was, uh, was, um, uh, was going to EP it and uh, direct uh, some of the episodes. So I, once I heard that, I was very, very interested in uh, and I love uh, SLP. We go uh, back 30 years when I was uh, about to do her first play, uh, The Last Black Man in the Whole Entire World. And Six Degrees of Separation came up uh, at the same time. So I had to choose and um, broke her heart and kind of mine because I really wanted to play that, uh, play that role. And, but, um, you know, the circles go around and here we are 30 years later um, and uh, we're back. So. Uh, but it was those two. And then I'm a huge fan of Brian Grazer and uh, Ron Howard. And they had just done uh, a Pavarotti documentary in which I was just weeping, you know, uh, at the end of it uh, and during it. Um, so I, I, the, the compilation of complication of all three of those, uh, it uh, was the, the light was the light was going off. Do it, do it, do it. So. <laughs> And Cynthia, for you, obviously, Aretha is a legend and an icon. Was it exciting to have the opportunity to play her or intimidating or, or both? Um, I guess a combination of both, except I probably wouldn't use the word intimidating. I probably would use the word um, 
duty. I felt like there was a, uh, a huge sense of responsibility uh, that came along with playing this particular role. Um, and I was very excited by it. I was surprised that it was even coming in my direction because I, I didn't know it was happening until uh, someone had told me that someone had seen me singing on a red carpet and that was why they thought I might be right to play this this role. Um, so it all sort of became a kismet type of thing. It all sort of happened um, almost with, without me realizing it was happening. So when it came along, I knew that uh, there was a special thing in being able to celebrate someone's life in this way. Um, I mean, you've both played real people before to great acclaim, obviously. Um, I'm curious uh, if you enjoy portraying real people because you have so much research to draw on or if it differs from, you know, when you're creating a character from scratch. And I also assume it comes with a lot of extra responsibility when you're playing someone who really lived and breathed. Yeah, it was, uh, for, for me, it, it uh, and it just, it really depends. Uh, I was, um, uh, I was, in, I didn't want to see any footage for, um, uh, for Johnny Cochran. Uh, I felt that that would intimidate me. Uh, so I simply read uh, Jeffrey Tubin's book a few times, and then I saw a kernel of something. Um, and that, that, dragged me through whenever I felt myself. Because in, in television, you're working so fast, two or three episodes at the same time. Um, so you really don't have time to be, okay, let me make sure that I'm, no, you don't have time. You, just, you have to make a choice and go with it. So I really, uh, and but for this one, for Genius, uh, his sermons were very, um, very readily available to me. And I needed um, that because we were, we would, I would be, preaching at any time. So I, I, uh, I just listened and listened and listened and, and uh, um, it, uh, I kind of fell into him. So that they, it depends, it depends on, on, uh, and I, and I'm, I'm doing something now where I'm, I'm, the person is, um, you know, fictional. So I'm, I, I kind of, it's kind of comforting <laughs> that I can, uh, I can uh, chart my own course and not to, you know, do a lot of listening and, you know, worrying about what people, their visions of thoughts of this person is. So had somebody recorded his sermons and they still had them on audio? No, he had records. Yeah, he yeah. had sermons on record. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he, he, he was a recording artist. He was one of That's the first amazing. ones to, uh, to record his sermons and then, you know, yeah. sell them, you know, so people could buy yeah. his sermons like albums. Mm -hmm. They were albums, so... Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And Cynthia, obviously for you, there's there's yeah. so much out there about Aretha Franklin, which yeah. you know, can be good, but also, you know, it's that's, that's yeah. a lot to go through. It was sort of a, a departure from what, what I had experienced with, with Harriet, because with Harriet, there isn't really very much. You have, you have a couple of books, you have imagery, you have pictures, and they only just recently found a, a newer image of her when she was, I think in her twenties, which actually was helpful because that was closer to the age uh, that she was when um, when she was working with the Underground Railroad and she was going back and forth uh, uh, and, sa and saving people and, and bringing people to freedom. Uh, she was very young. And so uh, what I had to go on was sort of my imagination, what I had read images that I had seen. Um, and, and because she, she didn't, she didn't write, she couldn't write herself. Often it was um, someone else's uh, idea of who she was and the knowledge of who they met uh, when they met her. So it's bringing, it was about bringing those things all together and creating something uh, for myself that felt like Harriet. Um, there's no recording of her, so you, there's no, uh, you don't have an idea of what her voice sounds like. So you have to find whatever voice felt right for her. I, I don't know, for me, I, I just, in my head knew that she wasn't a soprano speaking up in the hat, in the, the rafters of her voice just because of what she had to do and how much she had to command. Um, with Aretha, there's plenty. And for, but for me, I had to sort of focus it and decide what information I needed that would help me move forward in telling her story. And so for me, it was listening to her music for sure because we were, I was singing a lot of it 
um, on set and everything was live pretty much. Maybe one or two songs we went back and re-recorded, but everything else was on set and live. And so in order to make sure that I was at least adhering to the decision decisions that she had made in her music, I would be listening over and over and over and over again. And I had a, a wonderful uh, vocal coach who would sit with me and we would work through the songs, almost like homework, just finding the little decisions and tricks and turns that she would do, breaths that she would take so that we would be as close to the music as, as she was. Um, and I love watching her interviews because I felt like they give you an insight into who she was when she wasn't with her family and, and, and how that changed. Because from, if you take a look at an interview that happens maybe in the late sixties, that, and then you compare it to an interview that happens in the late eighties, all of a sudden she sort of found herself in the eighties and she's playful and she's fun and she's joking with the camera and she's laughing. And then sort of into the nineties where, you know, towards the end of her life, she becomes a, sort of more debonair, more sort of tongue in cheek. She can answer if she wants to, she can give you a one word answer if she wants to, or she can give you a whole sentence. It's sort of how she, she grew and you could, there's sort of a weird, wonderful progression that happens in these interviews as you watch her. And so I was sort of devouring all of that and all of her music and seeing as many images and pictures as you possibly can because she also made uh, statements with, with what she wore and how she dressed, yeah. That's what was so fascinating to me about this series because I just have an image of Aretha Franklin that she emerged fully as Aretha Franklin mm -hmm. as I knew her in the 80s and 90s. And I learned so much about her life thinking I knew her life and apparently I didn't. Um, was there anything that you learned that, you know, sort of dramatically changed your perception of Aretha when you began to research these characters? I think for me, the, the thing that, that struck me as surprising was how long it took her to, to find her sound, how, how hard she worked to, to find out who she was. Um, and that it wasn't just about finding a particular style of music. It was really about finding out what she wanted to say with her music, who she wanted to be with her music and, and what she needed to tap into in order to find the sound that she she ended up creating this, her being the queen of soul came from being unashamed of pulling from her gospel background, pulling from the music that she was singing when she was a child in order to make the sound uh, her own. I, I just, I guess I didn't know how much time and how, how much effort it took for her to get to that place. Um, and really and truly she, you know, I didn't know how early she started singing for one thing. I didn't know how early her first recording was. Uh, and so to know that it took, I guess, almost, say 10, 15 years after the first time we hear a recording for it to be, for her to get like a proper number one, for her to become popular was a surprise to me. Yeah. You just all, I guess you, when you hear Aretha Franklin, you assume she was always popular. Everybody loved her always. And Courtney, I don't know if you knew anything about CL going into this project or, you know, if, if you were familiar with him at all, but I'm sort of curious about what your perceptions were of him and if they changed over the course of making this. Well, you know, I think the, the, the main thing is that as, as a people, uh, uh, Black folks, you know, were given nothing. And out of that nothing, uh, whole cakes and and uh, hog mogs and and sweet potato pet pies and yams and and we made something out of the nothing and and the country was was really built on the backs of our nothing mm -hmm. and and that's what you know I, I look at CL's life and the the father gave his his stepfather gave him a choice that the plow or the pulpit and he chose the pulpit and there was no safety net. He said, okay, you choosing the pulpit, get out. And uh, uh, Aretha, you know, uh, uh, with her, her music and uh, um, the, going to New, to New York and you would think as, as Cynthia said, that she was like Nancy Wilson, be able to go and, and within six months she would have her number one, but that wasn't her rhythm. But, but even though that wasn't, she didn't stop. Mm -hmm. I think as a people, 
That's what we're about, that we don't, we have not stopped. It doesn't matter that you, you're trying to tell us that we're nothing and we can't do this and we can't do that. And that, that wasn't surprising to me. Um, that, was, that was more reaffirming that, 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 that CL instilled that in his children um, despite, yes, he was messy. He was a messy, messy man. Um, his, his, he and his wife, you know, did not, was not able to make it. Their mother weren't, was not able to make it. But in spite of that, they still remained tight and they went into the world like that. Now you couldn't get in between them. You, you, you try as you may, you couldn't, you couldn't get in, in, in there. And that, and as from our, our series on, on CO's, when he was in, on, you know, asleep in his coma, and um, Aretha was, "Daddy, I just need you to." Uh, you would think, as messy as he was, that the children would all be like, "That's you too much." To me, instills the the, the message of family mm -hmm. that this is about uh, as big as they were, as you know, as big as he was in the civil rights movement and the Million Dollar Boys. They were just a family mm -hmm. and trying to figure out. Where there were no rules coming up from the South, the, the Great Migration, there were no rules and we had to figure it out. And we figured out, did the best we could. And so for, for me, it was just a, a, re a reaffirmation of the resiliency of, of, of people of color. And, and that is the message, the main message uh, for, for this story of, of resiliency and, and the power of the human spirit. You use the word messy, which I think is such a great word. <laughs> um, but <laughs> CL and Aretha obviously did have a really complicated relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious about, I mean, your whole cast is fantastic from top to bottom. It's such an amazing ensemble. But the two of you have these amazing scenes together and you really do feel like family for all the good and bad that that entails. I'm really curious about working together and, and Courtney working with the actress who plays the younger Aretha um, also as well. She's, she's just a powerhouse. <laughs> yes, she, yes, she is. Yes, she is. Um, it, it, was, it was wonderful to be able to go from back and forth between the, the young and the, um, the mature. <laughs> Uh, more mature, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, and the, the 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 casting brilliance of of the the young girl, um, who I just adore. We all did. We just she's adore. wonderful, wonderful. Uh, you know, just coming in, uh, and her first scene being fifteen hundred, <laughs> you know, uh, singing her first time singing, yeah. and she was so nervous. Uh, uh, Cynthia, she she just she's just basically ran off the pulpit and went back into the little her little room and she was just shaking oh. so you know we had to bring her back out and the 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 uh, uh the congregation it was just like life the congregation was like yeah. okay it's okay it's okay it's okay yeah and she uh you know after the third go round she was a pro so it was it was Sweet, huh? beautiful and this lady here oh boy she's like, <laughs> come on now we just <laughs> We just followed her. You did. Where are we going now? <laughs> Come on, girl. Tell us what we're doing today. Oh, and you know, for me, I, I I didn't spend a lot. I didn't. I wasn't in those scenes where she was, you know, you know, trying to figure out her her sound and her 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 rhythm, and you know, slapping people and smoking and making making jokes and drinking and. Just trying to find her her way. I mean, it's just it was brilliant to actually see you, Cynthia. You know, find your way with Aretha and the shyness at first, and you know, and then after a while, then, wow. <laughs> you hit me. I'll hit you right back. You know, it's just it was beautiful to see the the transition. Thank you. I had so much fun working with, you know, one of my favorite scenes is in the doctor's office where he tells you that you have to uh, rest. I don't know, there was just something, it was so easy, just the laughter, the back and forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love watching that scene. I think that there's something really special about being able to, to be in this space together and play that tennis game, that back and forth, that you find the rhythm and then you, you know, it moves fast, it moves slow and that we just, I had a wonderful time being with you. I had, it was like a masterclass uh, working with you. Yeah, so I love you very much. You know, I feel about you the same. 
<laughs> Something else I love about the, the Genius series is the attention to detail and the costumes and, you know, all, all, everything is so beautiful. And I was thinking as an actor, you can do so much preparation for these roles, but how much does it help to step into the costumes and put on the hair and makeup and oh. truly transform? Oh my goodness. It, it helps a lot. There's just, there's like that one extra step that that pushes you further into the character. It's one thing to learn the, the lines, learn the rhythm, learn the music. But if you still look like you, you still look like you. But when that the hair comes on and the outfits are on and the makeup is on, you sort of disappear. And then someone else comes uh, into, into play. And it just really helps. It's, I, it's one of the things I used to do is ask for the shoes first, just because I wanted to feel how it felt to work in walk in the shoes. It, it, it's different when I'm in my own shoes and when I have the shoes of the character, I know what their feet feel like. Even if their feet hurt when they're working, it shifts how they move, shifts how they speak, shifts how they, they talk. Um, and so that being able to put the costume on, being able to put the shoes on uh, informs how you move as a, as, a, as a character in that world, yeah. Yes. Is, you know, and, and the time period was so was so mm -hmm. about clothes, and mm -hmm. hats, and you know, you, you know, men having processes, you know, afros, and you know, I just, you know, I, the, the, it is about the, it's all about the hair. Yeah, we know, women know it, but uh, yeah. but but I had a I had a do, so <laughs> you know, it's, it's all about the hair. I'm I'm falling back into them right now. It's all about the hair, baby. It's all about the hair. You know, it's uh, just seeing her, seeing Cynthia. What wig is she coming out with today? Is this, <laughs> that which is it. Today, which you know? beehive or which beehive? You know? Which Farrah Fawcett redhead? Oh. Yeah, and, you know, it's just wonderful to sort of watch because it, that really did inform what she was doing and what what is she going to come out with today and then you know one year it was blonde one year it was red she was a red head it was auburn one year it was pitch black another year it's long then it's short in the 80s and 90s it was the choppy with the with the long um piece in the front she just would keep changing it <laughs> she just would like play and it was just so much fun to like keep moving around in these spaces and look, what are we doing today okay we're we're here. I know which where where she's sitting today. I know how she feels today. I know oh she got her afro. We got the dashiki today. Okay, I understand. I get it. It was yeah. so, your team. Your 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 glamour team was wonderful. Was, and then sometimes the eyebrows, the the mascaras, it's just, just it's just it was so <laughs> wonderful to see the transformation. And it was absolute. Uh, Janelle it was an absolute transformation. We all were like, okay. All right, she's okay. Let, let me do the scene now. And between that, the hair, the the costume, the costume. Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer did so much research on the costuming. Uh, I would walk into her office, and she would have pictures um, everywhere, and and she would go so far as she found someone who would create uh, exact replicas of. Um, of the fabrics that were used for some of the clothes that Aretha would wear. Um, and then she would recreate the outfit from that. Um, she was incredible. Jennifer was a wonderful. And she did so much work, so much work. Unbelievable. I love this idea of literally and figuratively walking in someone else's shoes. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's such a, a great place to start. Um, I wanna remind everyone watching at home that all the episodes are now available so you can watch this again and again. You're both so wonderful in it. And on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performers. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you.